As humans, we tend to think that once animals reproduce, that they will naturally take care of their offspring, since it's such an important feature of growing up as a human. But there are many animals for whom the only parental care that they provide is just leaving their eggs somewhere where the young will have food to eat once they hatch. Our bias towards expecting parental care can cause us to ignore the fact that there are many good reasons for animals not to provide parental care to their offspring at all. Firstly, it takes up time and energy that could prevent you from mating again and making more offspring. Secondly, it takes up energy and nutrients that could be devoted into having larger clutches of offspring instead of a precious few. Many animals, like the frogs that laid the eggs that become these tadpoles, adopt a quantity over quality approach to reproduction. So if parental care has evolved, as is the case of this brown bear and her two growing cubs, it must bring about important fitness benefits in order to justify all the time and energy invested into it. Clearly, parental care may increase a parenting animal's fitness by improving the chances that their offspring survive and do well in life, compared to those that don't receive that care. It really is like a top-up on an already important investment, just to make sure that it leads to a successful outcome. Like all behaviors, those related to parenting come with costs that will vary from one context to another. But one thing is sure, animals will not engage in behaviors adaptively if the costs outweigh the benefits. As we've seen already, with the large investments into reproduction by females, they tend to be the ones to offer the care because failure at producing surviving offspring would be a huge loss for them. However, in some instances, we find that it is exactly for these reasons, meaning the proportionally larger investment by females, that male animals will be the ones to take up the caring role of the young. This is the case in St. Peter's fish, or tilapia, where it is the male fish that cares for the young clutch of eggs by mouth brooding them. For weeks, the male will not eat and will fan his clutch using his gills to oxygenate them and keep them safe from predators. This fasting period is a considerable cost. The fish will inevitably lose weight during the process and will need to regain it afterwards before they will be able to mate again. When biology researchers force the female tilapia to do the mouth brooding, the fasting period is shown to have a much greater impact on them because it takes the females much longer afterwards to regain their general state of health to a level that will allow them to mate again. Because of the unequal costs of parental care on female tilapia over the males, it is the reason that it's the males that undertake the business of mouth brooding for the young, because it's easier for them to do so, and both parents benefit from increased offspring survivorship. When care invested into offspring involves feeding, it can be the case that there's limited food to go around and not enough for everyone equally. In these instances, it would make sense for parent animals to invest preferentially into those offspring that have the highest chance of success overall. Due to genetic variation, some offspring in a brood may be weaker or sicker than the others, which may lead to developmental or health problems later in life and even threaten their survival. With limited resources to go around, many parent animals may choose to divest from those that are less likely to make it anyways, and to invest more into those that will really be able to make something of themselves in life. This difference in offspring fitness potential is called the reproductive value, and represents the intrinsic likelihood that an offspring will survive and reproduce successfully for themselves, and can be seen as a way to view the chances that any given offspring will get a slice of the limited pie, as their parents strategize their approaches to parental care. Little baby chicks of the American coot have their heads and necks ringed by some striking 
orangey-red feathers that are absolutely crucial to their survival. It's not that they will deter predators or anything like that. It's all about how they will be treated by their mother. If the color is not up to snuff, it could lead to the poor and drab little chick being shunned from the family and left alone for certain death. How could a parent interested in its fitness and reproductive success leave one of their offspring so heartlessly to die alone? American coot parents produce large brood clutches that are typically too big for the single parent to care for on her own, and she'll quickly begin to trim the brood down in size by ignoring some of the chicks. Orange redness in animals is produced by carotenoids, and these are associated with higher immune function because of their antioxidant effects. For this reason, orangey redness has evolved in a number of animals to show degrees of health because its presence in an individual implies that they're a good specimen in fine form and function. Parent coots can use the degrees of color in the chick's head plumage to distinguish between their offspring that are of higher and lower reproductive value, preferentially investing in those healthier ones and aggressively neglecting the sicklier ones. This seemingly callous behavior is an adaptive strategy for the parent coot birds to maximize their return on the investment in reproduction and to increase their own fitness benefits over the long run in the most optimal way possible by taking a quality over quantity approach to reproduction. As sad as it is for those cute little coot chicks. As hard as it is to contemplate, parent animals sometimes need to make difficult decisions when there are limited resources and too many mouths to feed. In other cases, the parents don't need to decide anything at all and let the young sort it out amongst themselves. In egrets, females typically have two surviving chicks to fledging despite there having originally been three eggs in her nest. The fate of that last bird chick is left up to the hands, or beaks rather, of their siblings. By the time that third egg has hatched, the other two chicks have already grown bigger and stronger over the day or two that they had as a head start. This gives them the gruesome advantage in competing for the limited food coming to the nest by pecking at the runt until it has died of the horrible physical abuse. And you thought your older sibling was a jerk. Shockingly, all this happens under the nonchalant gaze of the parent egret. It's hard to imagine that this behavior could be adaptive for adult egrets that are looking to raise a family while tolerating the siblicide of one of their young by the others. However, this is not an aberrant behavior. Rather, it is the norm in this species, which suggests that it's being maintained by positive adaptive selection. It appears at first glance to be a case of parent-offspring conflict, in that what is good for one may not necessarily be good for the other. Clearly, the parent will have one fewer offspring as a result. But what if the others do better as two than they would have as a family of three chicks in that nest? It turns out that they do, in fact, fare better than if the parental care were split among three instead of two chicks. And this leads to better reproductive success for them later on down the line. By producing more offspring, siblicidal chicks may give their parent more grandchildren than they would have had by sharing their resources with the defunct chick that is no more. Furthermore, by investing the limited resources into the stronger chicks from the outset, the parent egret is caring for those that had the higher reproductive value to start with and maximizes her return on that investment. Because parental care is costly to adult animals, we would expect that it should be important to make sure that the care is directed towards the animal's own offspring and not in others. When the chances of mixing up the young from different families is possible, we find that kin recognition becomes an increasingly adaptive trait for parents to possess. This would be the case when animals live in large breeding colonies and parents must distinguish between their young from a plethora of others in the crowd. Cliff swallows are colonially nesting birds, with hundreds to thousands of nest cavities excavated into the sandy cliffs of their nesting habitat. Although they may know roughly which section of the cliff where their nest entrance is located, 
the final determinant of knowing their abode from that of their nearest neighbors comes from the chirping sounds from within. Adult cliff swallows are capable of telling which brood of chicks is their own from the sound alone. As an adaptive feature in parent-offspring communication among these crowded cliff swallow populations, the chicks have evolved chirps that are unique, complex, and distinct from one another, allowing the parents to learn the particular sounds of their own kin and to ensure that they're returning to the right nest and feeding their own offspring and not the neighbors. If you compare the sounds of the chirps coming from cliff swallows to their close relatives but a solitary nesting species, the barn swallows, there's around 16 times more sonic information contained in the chirps from the colonial cliff swallow chicks than from the chirps of the solitary barn swallow chicks. The likelihood of a barn swallow parent mistaking another's nest for their own is low, so it would not be adaptive for their chicks to require complex chirps to get the care that they need. Kin recognition is adaptive for parent animals that need to ensure that they are sending their invested care somewhere that they will get to reap the fitness rewards and not some other stranger parent. Because caring for offspring that is not one's own is a zero-sum game, meaning that it seems to be all cost and no benefit for the hapless parent that takes care of another's young, it becomes paradoxical to think about adoption. Many adult animals will actively recruit and adopt stray young that are not their own and care for them as if they were. This is especially true in colonially breeding populations of animals, like these ring-billed gulls, where the availability of orphaned young may be high. Adoption is seen as a Darwinian puzzle, or some kind of behavior that defies adaptive intuition, because it seems to come at a cost to the individual and have no apparent fitness benefit. But that picture may come into focus a bit more when we acknowledge that there's often a high degree of relatedness between individuals in the colony, and that means that the little orphaned gull chick might be a distant family member. As we will discuss in the next episode, Natural selection can favor helping behaviors when it promotes the passing on of common genes found between the helper and the helpee, such as a herring gull adult and chick. In this manner, some adult gulls that didn't manage to find a mate and produce offspring of their own can still contribute some of the family genes to the next generation by caring for an adopted chick in need that may be a niece or a nephew, instead of direct kin of their own. There's also another compelling explanation for this adoptive behavior that is not mutually exclusive from the first. It could be that the parent gull or other adoptive animals cannot help themselves when a helpless youngling is begging for their care. Parental nurturing and care in higher animals like birds and mammals is sometimes so strong that it can lead to being maladaptively offered to any young that will take it. This strong desire to be a parent is surely adaptive in most contexts, because it can lead to great improvements in offspring health and well-being, and those would be good fitness benefits when it's your own young. Because this innate desire to parent is so adaptive in the grand scheme of things, it can become manipulated to apply to young of all sorts, whether they're your own or not. It might also help to explain why animals that failed their attempt at reproducing are so willing to care for other young if they get the chance. The irrepressible desire to be a good parent can lead some birds to suffering a terrible fate when they fall victim to nest parasites, other species of birds that will lay their own eggs in the nests of others and leave the defaulted adoptive parents to pick up the bill and cover all costs related to the parental care of their chicks. This adult reed warbler has returned to its nest to find a massive cuckoo chick begging for care. Although the chick may already be bigger than its adoptive parent, the adult warbler quickly begins searching for enough food to collect to feed this insatiable chick in its nest. While the adult is away on foraging expeditions in the forest, the nest parasite chick may push out the remaining warbler eggs that were in the nest thus ensuring that the cuckoo will get the full attention of its duped and hapless adoptive parent. As that adult warbler attempts to keep up with the appetite of this massive cuckoo chick, 
She is surely running herself ragged and reducing any chances she has of finding enough energy to reproduce again once this young has fledged her caring nest. The adoptive reed warbler is certainly paying a high price, but she may not be able to help herself because a parent that doesn't care for chicks in her nest will never successfully breed. So the instinct remains at play. Also, given that the reproductive value of this mega chick may be working as a super stimulus and overloading her with a parental desire on hyperdrive, convincing her that this offspring is worth the effort, even if it's the last thing that she ever does. And unfortunately for her, it may very well be. If nest parasitism remains rare, it may fly under the selective radar and continue to exploit the occasional victim bird into caring for another's offspring. Some species of birds have co-evolved with nest parasites and adapted traits or behaviors that allow them to avoid these traps if at all possible. Other species of warblers are capable of recognizing the foreign egg in their nests and may eject it over the side or bury it in layers of the floor of the nest. If the nest becomes parasitized early enough in her breeding process, she may decide to start all over somewhere else and build a new nest altogether. Some nest parasite birds have evolved behaviors that attempt to curb these abandonments of their young by the host species by physically harassing them if they don't cooperate. Brown-headed cowbirds are a species of nest parasite whose young are not murderous of the other chicks in their host's nest and instead will tolerate the others like its own siblings. However, in order to ensure that the warbler behaves and cares for the young parasite in its nest, the bigger and meaner brown-headed cowbirds have developed something that you might call the mafioso bird tactic. The cowbirds patrol the nests that they have laid their young in and bully the warbler adults into submission. These mafioso birds will terrorize the adoptive parents until they play by the parasite's rules. If they do not, they will execute the host's young one at a time in true mafia style. In this case, the poor innocent warbler is probably best just to suck it up and accept the terms of the mafia cowbirds. That way, she can at least raise her own young plus that parasite chick, which is way better than getting left with just the cowbird chick as a punishment for misbehaving. We have seen that animals will care for their offspring when it's adaptive to do so. Given all the potential costs, it's not an easy decision to be a parent. And let me tell you, I speak from experience. Whether the key to success is in the quality of the young or the quantity produced, the real winners will be the parents whose young survive best and pass on those family genes to the next generation. When it comes to what's important for the family, maybe it is true that parents know best. <laughs>